The development of a country, well, the development of a whole co continent, in fact, uh, requires a set of services, a set of infrastructure, a set of relationships that are that are multifaceted. They're highly complex, and and it's just <laughs> frankly hard work. And and part of that infrastructure that's just so important is the sovereign debt market. Uh, that's because it helps develop out financial markets, which are enable an enabler to growth, but also because um, well, government governments need it. And so um, we're very lucky today to have Dr. Vera Songwe with us because she's the chair of the Liquidity and Sustain Sustainability Facility that we're going to hear about today. And of course, that's a big part of shoring up these sovereign debt markets. Um, she's also the um, co-chair of the high-level uh, panel on climate finance, which is working to develop uh, highly functioning carbon markets in, in uh, Africa. She's a non-resident senior fellow of uh, the Brookings Institution just up the road. Um, and before that, and I could go on forever about her CV, but, <laughs> but, but I'm, I'm going to go on for a little bit more because it's just so amazing, this, this career. She was an undersecretary general at the United Nations. Uh, she was the executive secretary of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. And the list of all these other achievements, um, again, I said I can't do it justice, but you know, suffice it to say that she was on the list as one of Africa's 50 most powerful women by Forbes. She was one of the 25 Africans to watch by the Financial Times. She's going to be so embarrassed <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not done. She's written extensively on development and economic issues. The list goes from debt infrastructure development to fiscal and, and governance issue. Uh, she has a PhD in mathematical economics from the Center of Operations Research in Econometrics. She has a Master's of Arts in Law and Economics and a Diplôme d'études de profondie in economic science <laughs> and politics from the Université Catholique de Louvain in Belgium. And, and the list goes on. But I'm going to skip to that she was a student of Our Lady of Lourdes College in Barmenda, Cameroon. So with that, over to you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you uh, uh, very much, uh, Caroline, for, for that. Uh, Caroline and I have been talking, and it's a pleasure uh, to have you uh, moderating this session for many reasons, uh, but mostly because uh, the work that she's done is much, much more impressive and bigger than uh, uh, what I'm doing in the uh, first woman uh, to be uh, on the board of the Canadian uh, Central bank, which is not, you know, now these days the central banks are the ones who run the world, which is what we're going to be talking about. So <laughs> that's the power of it. And so thank you very much. Also, let me just thank uh, the JRC Public uh, Policy uh, uh, Center as well, and everybody. Nancy is not here, uh, in particular, but Nancy and her team for making sure that uh, we landed and came in one piece. Really, really, thank you so much uh, for all the work that happens behind to make. You know, this happened. It's been uh, amazing. And of course, uh, Leonard and the conversations that we had with your teams and all the students that have been here. Now, I have, I think, 15 minutes uh, to talk very quickly about something that um, I've now been really, really passionate about for the last two years, which is essentially uh, financial stability and liquidity. And I see uh, Chris here and a couple of people that we spend uh, evenings and days talking about different dimensions of it. Uh, but it's now something that um, I'm very passionate about. And so just very quickly, the outline of the presentation, growth and the poly crisis, talk a little bit about financial stability and market access, the liquidity challenge. I think uh, Chris is going to talk about some of this as well tomorrow from a different take, I think, uh, and, and Jill and other people. Uh, and then the liquidity and sustainability facility that um, I, I, ch I chair, I'll tell you a little bit more about it. And then policy options for uh, Africa's development and the future as we go forward. You can't really see the slide, but this is really just to talk about, uh, 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 oh, you can, maybe. It's, it's, uh, my screen is, is much smaller. But uh, uh, to talk about growth, and I think that uh, in, in December, we had the IMF, uh, the last uh, sort of actually October, we had the IMF forecast come out, 
And the IMF said, you know, global growth was going to go down. We we're going to have global growth at about 3.4%. Uh, uh, projections were going to be uh, somewhere around 26 And then at Davos, it was this big thing about Kristalina saying, oh, you know, everything is looking better and it's all going to go up and things are going to improve. And, and everybody was kind of like, in 10 days, the new data is going to come out. It came out and it was 0.3% increase in growth. So we had gone up. So the trend was up and we hadn't really done a lot. But particularly for uh, uh, emerging market economies in Africa in particular, you know, when the numbers came out, it hadn't really moved that much. We're still at 3.8% growth. With population growth at about 3%, we're really going no way. And let's remember that with the COVID crisis, Africa had its first recession in 25 years. So essentially, you know, we hit rock bottom and are still struggling to come out. And we really need for any sort of sustainable growth to happen on the continent, we need two-digit growth. We need to be in the 10%. So there is nothing uh, 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 comforting about three, five. And, you know, in our best days, we were growing at 6.5%. So at the very least, you know, we should go back to sort of what we were calling the roaring uh, uh, 2000s when, you know, commodity prices in China was guzzling at 12% and we were sort of coming behind at 6, 6.5% sustainably for 10, 12 years. Clearly, we are no, not anywhere near uh, uh, that. But not only are we not growing, but because of the COVID crisis and because the developed world learned a lot of lessons from uh, the 2008 crisis and the fact that when there is uh, a crisis and, and anything that is affecting growth, we should sort of inject liquidity into the economy to make sure that nothing crashes and the world continues to grow. What happened is when COVID hit, you know, in less than eight months, uh, Carolina and her peers in central banks around the world came up with new liquidity instruments. And having learned from what happened in 2008 and 2009, injected the developed world with tons of liquidity to make sure that, you know, companies, individuals, households uh, do not go under. And so essentially, in the space of about eight months, $8 trillion was injected into G7 economies with different sort of monetary instruments uh, to make sure that uh, 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 the economy didn't collapse and we didn't have to rebuild. Now, uh, having put all of those resources into the economy, we overheated the economy. So we have to cool it down. And the process of cooling it down means we have to be aggressive about inflation. We have to tackle inflation. We have to tackle it. Uh, but what is happening is that we also signed a lot of uh, 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 checks out to individuals who don't really need a lot of uh, 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 the labor markets are overheated. You know, consumption continues to grow. So it's very difficult to tame inflation when you've given all these resources to people. So, you know, we have to do a lot of it. And I think the central bank uh, minutes of the meetings came out yesterday again. And I think Jay Powell is continuing to be uh, uh, hawkish about it. And, and we're probably going to see some more rate increases, at least if you listen to what the minutes of the meeting say from yesterday. That essentially means that the developing countries are importing huge inflationary pressures again uh, from uh, the developed world without having received the initial liquidity injections that the developed world got. So we have to deal with that uh, additional crisis. And so what is happening to us uh, in terms of um, bond markets, our access to additional liquidity and additional growth? And part of the, 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 what happened during the good roaring years of Africa's growth is that we went from about three to five countries that had access to markets for to raise capital to almost 23 countries that were able to go to the markets to raise capital at different rates, of course. And so one of the uh, 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 you know, positives, I think, was that more African countries had access to more financing to grow faster, which is what we, uh, resulted in sort of the overall average 6% growth sustainably for over 15 years was that we had access to not just World Bank capital prior to that. We had 60% of, uh, 60 to 80% of the capital that was coming to the continent was uh, a multilateral development bank capital, but now we had exposure to uh, global fin uh, financial markets and the bond market. Now, what these two graphs show you is, and, and look at the, the axis, because the, if you don't look at the axis, you can get uh, confused. I, I don't know if I can now, maybe, see if I can press the red. Okay, yes. So essentially, yeah, you want to look at the, those numbers on that side and, and on this side. And so these are the developed economies, right? E EU leveraged lo loans, global high yield bonds, US leveraged loans, and global investment grade bonds. And so if you look at them, um, 
on the so it's your your left hand side essentially it's about 400 basis points right and then that's you know 2000 that's covid you know dash for cash and you know and the sort of new instruments that came into the market to bring the markets down and 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 calm the markets and get the market functioning uh, well again um, we see that and then you have the sort of global investment grade bonds and even at the highest peak of the problems in 2022 we had them up at you know 220 basis points now look at this side the emerging markets and what's happening to the emerging markets the emerging markets the best sort of performing emerging markets are the investment grade invest, uh, uh, emerging markets non african countries in this in that list but essentially they, they 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 go to the market at about 200 basis points which is the peak of uh, so you see that's the 200 basis points right there right and for the sort of eu leveraged loans it's around 400 so it's twice that much in which is uh, essentially what is happening if you are emerging markets in general so the brazils of the world now if you are frontier markets so which is africa that's where you are right 1200 basis points that's what it costs us to borrow the same kind of money so if you're trying to build a water plant or we do an energy investment or you know it's not that there's no bankable project it's just that the cost of money is so high that nobody will you know it's impossible to do it but that's that's what we face when we go to the markets and so we need to sort of solve that problem and and and, and essentially if we don't solve that problem and we continue to go to the markets at those rates then it doesn't matter how much we try we're you know sort of in quicksand and we're going to go under very quickly but even in good times right so you look at it's, it's, it's i think it's easy to talk about the bad times because then the bad times there is capital flight and everybody is going to safety and so you say yes you know it, the, the the spreads are very high and you know with covid markets closed there was no revenue so all the big ratios all the good ratios are getting bad every way but if you look at sort of when there was a little bit more stability even then right our stable normal was three times, you know, the best uh, investment grade in, uh, emerging markets. Or if you remember, at some point, countries like Germany were, and Japan were at negative interest rates. You know, actually, they were paying people to borrow from them, right? This is what was happening in another part of the world. And the question is, why do we have that kind of divergence? Now, what happens when you're an emerging market economy and you face this? You end up like this. You end up with your ratios, as I said, being just unsustainable overall. And so what you end up with is debt to GDP levels that go from 30% uh, in 2010 uh, here to almost 70% uh, debt to GDP ratios. A lot of it because of COVID, because of inflation. Remember that inflation then causes, just because of the tightening in the United States and, and Europe, we have a trillion dollars that has been added to emerging market debt just because of the exchange rate differential because we're borrowing in foreign currency. And so again, what is happening is if you look at you know, the different uh, uh, countries and their exposure to markets, it's what we are seeing also is a change from uh, um, the, those that are going to the markets and those that are still borrowing uh, uh, concessional resources. Uh, uh, hard currency bond uh, maturities, and this is the big problem when you look at all the conversations that are happening now, is that in 2024 and 2025, we are going to see a lot of those expensive bonds. Uh, and, and there will be some more conversation about this coming to maturity. And so countries are going to have to pay. And with, you know, hawkish uh, feds and ECBs around the world, most of it euro bonds, what is going to happen is, you know, uh, uh, economies are going to be facing very steep uh, payment uh, uh, calls for themselves. And so you have that. We also show a little bit uh, uh, in that last graph, and this is an IMF, uh, 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 no, actually it's from the Financial Stability Report. It is an IMF report as well. But just to give you a little bit of a sense of what is happening, if you look at this last graph, the red is the bond, the bond market, right? And what has been happening, and I think Ghana is, uh, as, as we all know, Ghana is going uh, to the IMF now, is the third one, one, two, three. So that's Ghana right there. And you can see even Ghana doesn't have huge sort of market bond exposure. They have a lot of official uh, exposure as well. Some of the official exposure is, of course, China, which is also, and GL is here, one of the, sort of the big elephants in the room, uh, is Chinese debt, which uh, is actually, uh, uh, just to be clear, 
uh, a lot of Chinese debt is actually cheaper than Eurobond debt, which is another reason why we should uh, have been working at seeing how one can uh, reduce uh, uh, the access to Eurobond debt. This is just a, 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 a much more um, expanded uh, uh, presentation, again, of the different segments, bilateral uh, debt repayments that are going to come are the dark blue, the light blue is multilateral, and uh, the green is uh, private uh, uh, obligations that are going to come through. So part of the problem that I started thinking about was, you know, when we go to the markets, when emerging markets, frontier uh, uh, economies go to the market, they face sort of three different criteria to price their spreads, right? The first criteria is their macroeconomic fundamentals, that to GDP, revenue, uh, your governance, structural policies, and, 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 and whether uh, uh, you, you can actually, uh, uh, make, you're making the right investments, and the rate of return of those investments is enough and sufficient uh, uh, to pay back on your debt. Now, the second uh, component of the price of your bond is something called the liquidity premium. And that essentially is the purchaser of that security is saying, if I purchase the security, can I make it liquid? And what is the cost of liquefying the security? And for much of the African paper, you cannot make it liquid because there is not an active market, an active secondary market where you can resell uh, uh, that security. So essentially, they transfer the price of the bond onto the country. And that's why, for some re for for a while, actually, we've been talking about oh, the fact that you know it, 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 we had you know seven to ten years. Actually, it used to be five to seven. Then we went to seven to ten, and now it's a huge improvement if an African country issues a fifteen to thirty year bond. But Benin issued a fifteen to thirty year bond. If you look at the prices, you know. But part of it is because nobody wants to give you an asset that they cannot make. Uh, uh, liquid very fast, right? So they charge you for it. And if I cannot uh, uh, create the liquidity that I need soon enough, as we say, you know, cash is king. And so if I cannot go very quickly to cash, then I price you for that. And sometimes it's about 170, 250 basis points plus in the cost of the bond. So that's just an additional cost for a technology that you can create and a problem that you can solve. And also because I want my liquidity when I want it, I don't want to lock it up for 30 years. So even though I know that I'm giving you a bond because you want to sort of build an energy plant that is going to take you 15 years, I'm like, yeah, fine, you know, tough luck. You know, come back again in seven years and I'll give you a second one. So I give you two seven years as opposed to one fourteen, right? And I charge you for it. So these are all sort of adjustments that the purchaser of that security is making to ensure that they don't lock themselves into this illiquid position, particularly with the kinds of crises that we have and the need for you know, constant liquidity to make sure that you can shore up your own positions. Now, if I give you a, a, a and so then the third uh, uh, segment of the, the pricing of our bonds is what we call the perception premium, and Hippolyte has written uh, some work on that. And essentially, is in the, I think the sort of standard example is the one of Ghana, where you know, uh, one of the rating agencies hires a young uh, uh, economist to rate the Ghanaian economy. He sits in his office, he calls a few friends, and the president of Ghana has just visited Mali, and he thinks that Mali and Ghana are close, and so he essentially downgrades, you know, they call him over and they say, what did you do? And it's just, you know, not enough knowledge, not enough information. If you're in the United States, the U.S. Treasury has a whole battery of people that are interacting with rating agencies, explaining policy, explaining what's happening. Or if you're another country and the rating agencies send you a, for a sheet to say, fill this data, and essentially everybody's traveling to Princeton to come and listen to a course and to this and to that, and nobody sort of fills the sheet and sends it back on time, and they think, oh, these people are not transparent, they're not giving me the right data, so I don't believe anything they say. So there's those kinds of things that we can fix. That's a solvable problem as well. That could also help us uh, uh, reduce the rate. Here I'm going to talk mostly about the repo markets and uh, what we can do with to provide more liquidity and bring down the cost. And this is the <coughs> Bank of International Settlements that talks about repos and it says the world functioning repo market supports liquidity, price discovery in cash markets, and helps to improve the cost of funding for firms and governments. And it's an efficient allocation of capital. So in the United States, the repo market is a market anywhere between four to sixteen trillion dollars. Uh, and that essentially is what keeps the US market going. You know, when you have huge crises, you know, new repo facilities, temporary ones are put in place. Actually, because of the COVID and then the Ukraine crisis, 
the Federal Reserve Bank has created two permanent repo facilities to continue to provide liquidity. I think that we're opening them and closing them and crises are just happening one after the other. So you say, let's keep them open and let's make sure that people have access to liquidity as quickly as they can. And an important thing about this in which we should look at later is a lot of the conversation when we talk about and all of you are reading the FT and we're talking about haircuts and all these things. The interesting thing about the repo facilities in the United States is there's no haircut. We are essentially transferring all the risk from the private sector to the public sector and providing the private sector with liquidity. But when you talk about Zambia and you talk about Ethiopia and all, everybody's saying, oh, but the private sector must take a haircut. And, you know, if they don't have a haircut, we can have a discussion and come to the table looking at this. And I'm thinking, what is different? Why can we do, you know, uh, give liquidity in the developed world to tons of uh, uh, firms and even in the UK, when we had the list trust crisis, essentially, the Bank of England came in and said, you know, anybody who can meet their obligations, we're going to put all these instruments out and you just come and get the cash and you're going to get it at mark to market. There was no additional. Daryl Doffy, you know, one of our big economists says, if you want to do this, you have to at least have a little bit of a margin for some penalty. We're not doing that in the developed world. There's no penalty. In the developing world, every time you open the newspaper, it's all oh, the haircut, and the private sector has to come and take this haircut, and it has to be painful. And if it's not painful enough, we will not give it. There is a conversation that is very, very asymmetric, and we need to fix it. So we created this repo facility, which is essentially saying, you know, we can actually do this. Where one can create it, it can, it can either be created by development institutions, and I think this is part of the conversation that we should have as we go forward. Is there, is there a role for the IMF? Essentially, the IMF, like the central banks, is the lender of the last resort for developing and emerging market economies. We have seen central banks in the developed world that were lenders of last resort extend the tools that they have because crises are multiplying and we need new instruments like repos and other things that are coming into the market. But the IMF has stayed as lender of the last resort. So the way I say it is the IMF looks at you and says, until your temperature is 104 degrees, I can't come. You have to be dying or dead, and then I'll come. In the meantime, I talk to the FT that you are about to die. <laughs> the Fed says, your temper is 100. You're getting to 101. I'm going to start giving you liquidity so that you don't get 104. We keep you alive. And then when you stay alive, I'll come and make sure that I punish you later, or maybe even not, right? And so, so, so that is, again, the difference. Is, is it time for us? And the IMF is doing its job. That's what it was meant to do, is to wait until you collapse, and then we come and find you. But we have now understood that when you collapse, it takes a lot longer to come back up. And so essentially what we need to do is see whether we can carry you over as opposed to let you collapse. And I give the example, and many of you will understand this, in the United States, if you have a house and you need quick liquidity, you can go and get a home uh, equity line of credit. You still keep your underlying asset. You get some liquidity, you solve the immediate problem, and you continue. If you are an African country today and you need liquidity, you sell the asset and you pay for whatever it is that you need to pay for, and their country's going through that right now. So when you come out of that process, you're much, much, uh, you're less uh, uh, endowed than you were when you got in. So the probability that you're going to fall again is higher. And so again, the whole sort of development framework is not working well. So with the liquidity and sustainability facility, which we have launched and which is working, we think we can save $11 billion in the next five years on uh, African spreads. First, you save the, because you can make the, 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 the security liquid, you save for the person who is buying immediately and the country gets that. Now, the risk that we are taking is not the country risk, and this is uh, important to explain. We are taking the risk of the buyer of the security. So it's a PIMCO risk, it's a Citibank risk, it's an Amundi risk, and these are all investment grade institutions. So the probability that they will default on a billion dollar African security is very, very low. They could still do it, but, but you know, we saw Burstons go under at some point, and they got bought over by JP Morgan, so JP Morgan will take that. Now, if the country's macroeconomic performance worsens, it is marked to market because they sell us the full price of the security. So they will come and sort of close the gap. If the country's macroeconomic performance improves and the security lowers, then we pay them back the excess. And so it's always at par with the, the, the price of the bond. So it's a market that functions and functions efficiently uh, uh, if one were to do it. And essentially, if we begin to provide this kinds of well-functioning uh, uh, capital markets for the developing world, we will not continue having these conversations of debt overhangs and debt crises every three months. We don't see that happening as often. If the UK was Egypt, the UK will be discussing with the IMF now for six, seven months. 
The reason the UK is not discussing with the IMF is because they immediately got the injection of liquidity <coughs> to manage those 44 days of crisis because of interest rate spikes that they had. And so now they're sort of trying to get their economy back and, you know, the, uh, uh, the exchequer is writing a new budget plan and moving forward. Egypt is discussing with the IMF and selling off assets to make sure that it can survive one more day and leave to, to tell the story. I think that is it, the dichotomy with, it, with development and why you know, countries get stuck in this middle income trap. Because you get to the market, right? You grow enough that you're no longer poor, you get into the market, and then you get trapped there because of the market infrastructure. The way I like to say it sometimes is that we have uh, rural roads, and now these economies have become more modern economies, and people are driving Lamborghinis and I don't know what, but we're still using rural roads. So every three minutes, you jump into a pothole, and you can't get out, and the car is stuck, and you fix it, you know, and then you go into the next pothole. We need the highways of fi financial infrastructure and financial architecture to actually make sure that we go to the destination that we want to go to. And we know how to do it. We can do it before it was eclectic. But between tw uh, uh, with the crisis of uh, 2020, the COVID, first tw 2008 was when we really started sort of experimenting on some of these new instruments. But with uh, 2020, we really used them, and they worked well. They saved the economy from collapse, and we used them again with the Ukraine crisis. So the question is, is it time for us to you know, really begin to maybe offer some of these tools uh, to the emerging market economies uh, uh, in a way that works well? We can do it either directly through a private sector uh, 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 structure, which is what we have done with the liquidity and sustainability facility, which is essentially uh, we are privately funded, so the, 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 our counterparty is our free exit bank that is providing the funding, and we are still trying to raise uh, some more funding. And then we just work with uh, purchases of African security. Or you can do it as an institutional setup inside you know, an institution like the IMF or the World Bank or, or, or the IFC. And I think that uh, part of what we're going to be doing going forward is thinking about what is the best option and what is the best structure for it. Uh, from a market perspective, Bank of New York Mellon does it for the United States. They do repos of $5.5 trillion a day, a day. The GDP of the whole continent is $2.3 trillion. They repo $5.5 trillion a day. This is just to tell you sort of the sort of market multiplier and how markets can function and function well. We believe that if this happens, the conversations around debt sustainability and debt overhangs will sort of maybe abate. The liquidity and sustainability facility does not help you if you have bad macro fundamentals. Let's be clear. You have to have good macro fundamentals to start with. Because remember that the, 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 the offering is first your macro fundamentals, then the liquidity premium and the perception. So if your macro fundamentals are bad, then you don't even get in the market. So there is no conversation with the LSF to start with. So you must have good macro fundamentals, and that is an important, essential uh, component of it. We believe that with the liquidity and sustainability facility, there is a whole group of potential purchases of Africa's securities that who will come into the market, who are a group that need liquidity, who want liquid uh, uh, securities, but never come into the African market because they can't get it. And so that also pushes up the price because we have a very limited uh, scope of people who come in the market. And if we have something like the LSF, then we will have more uh, interest in the African market and that will push down prices. And uh, eventually, we would also like to do uh, work using the liquidity and sustainability facility around greeniums. As you all know, a lot of African countries, when we issue green bonds, they are more expensive than uh, plain banana bonds. So it's just not worth it to even bother to issue green bonds if you're an African country. We've been able to stand this up with the help of Bank of New York Mellon. They are actually our custodian. So we haven't had to sort of go through uh, uh, all the FTC regulations because we work through Bank of New York Mellon. We are now doing another deal with Amundi, and uh, of course, uh, our counterparty funder is uh, the uh, uh, Afri Exim Bank and uh, Professor Orama, who is a huge believer and supporter in uh, the process. Our first deal was with Citibank uh, uh, for 100, and we've sort of closed. It's a, essentially, it's a weak repo, and we went through it. We're also trying to use bundles of African securities. So the first one, we worked with uh, Egypt, Kenya, Angola, because over time we would like to create a yield curve and sort of have a yield curve for the 23 African countries uh, that today are market participants. What are the next steps? Essentially is to look at, rather than sort of rush every time there is a crisis, rushing and waiting for African debt uh, uh, unraveling and the whole place to go. Because what is happening is, yes, there is a credit crunch on the continent, 
But essentially, why aren't we seeing any countries yet you know, collapsing? We are substituting education expenditure and social welfare expenditure and health expenditure just to be able to honor our market obligations because, and I say to the IMF, the biggest conditionality for African countries and many frontier countries is market access. They have put that conditionality on themselves, so they will do anything to keep their market access. And so essentially, they, anything that they can cut in current expenditures to ensure that they keep market access is what they're doing, which essentially just means that the poor are getting poor and it's very regressive as, as an action. And so we need to find ways of doing that. We're looking for funding. Uh, the other thing is to work more with central banks and to see whether we can develop a particularly emerging market economy central banks, whether some of the tools that are being used in the developed economies can also be used uh, uh, in those emerging markets and backstopped by them. And one of the repo facilities that has been opened by the US Fed is actually a foreign uh, currency repo facility, but to see how you know, more frontier markets can actually have access to that. Uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in an organized way will be something that we want to look at. And finally, what we are doing now, of course, is that we're working with euro bonds, but eventually we really need local currency bond issuances that would work well and stave off some of these foreign exchange crises and the cost of it uh, that is coming uh, uh, to us. How can we do this better? How can we make capital markets a much more critical part of sort of the development agenda and have institutions like the World Bank and the IMF and others work more with the private sector and the markets because that's where the capital is. A lot of the MDB reform conversation is about additional capital to uh, these developing agencies and nobody's putting SDRs in. We want more SDRs, they are not coming. We want more uh, paid in capital, it's not coming. We want capital increase, we see stretch your balance sheet. But maybe working better and in a more organized way with the monetary policy arm of the development conversation and the private sector and capital markets will provide us with the liquidity and the financing that we need in a much faster and much more efficient and transparent way, uh, I believe. Thank you very much for your attention. It's an observation that it it seems so um, intuitive that you know if you're going to have a you know a liquid and vibrant bond market that you have a bond market and actually all the markets that pile on top you actually need to have repo I mean, without repo you don't really have anything and we found that out the hard way uh, during the GFC when even companies that might have been worrisome in some way but were solvent we're under threat of becoming insolvent. So you can see that translate to, to governments quite easily. And I, I kind of sense, and maybe from conversations that we've had previous to this, that it was a hard sell, um, not only to the countries themselves, but also to the IMF. And I'm, and I'm just wondering, um, why do you think that was? And, and how did you kind of get over that to get your very first kind of partner in it? Because it's, it's pretty impressive. You, you kind of go through, oh, well, now we have this LSF. But it was a big lift on your part and obviously your team. No, no, I think that's a good question. I think two things. One is, is, is it was an instrument that even the G7, the developed, uh, 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 sorry, economies, I think, started really trying out uh, uh, in, in 2008 with a lot of sort of enthusiasm, right? We have used them a couple of times, I think, during the First World War, uh, 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 the, the, the US to introduced some kind of liquidity mechanisms during the Second World War. I think the UK introduced some kind of liquidity mechanism, but, but they were one off and they were sort of never really ingrained in either central banks or treasuries. In 2008, we started creating them and, and then I think for many of us in the room, and particularly our leaders, you say repo, and people are like, what are you talking about? Nobody knows what it is. And then the second question is, am I getting any money out of it? And, and you know directly, but it's going to reduce your spreads. This is sort of, sort of a hyper, you know, fictitious, eventually will it will reduce your spreads. But most of what our leaders will talk about is, oh, we hate the rating agencies, and the rating agencies are not doing the right thing, and they're rating us badly. And you say, no, the rating, I am a believer in rating agencies because you need somebody in the market to tell me whether I'm solvent or not and whether I should be investing 
in in a particular asset or not that's the rating agency's job all they all they exist to do is to tell you whether you know the client is solvent in the next month or not that's what they do but then that liquidity premium is something that we can solve and that's not a rating agency problem that is a, a purchaser of the security who is saying I don't want to make my asset illiquid, so I'm going to charge you for it. The rating agency has nothing to do with that component. And I think the, the developed markets solved that problem and also understood that there was a difference between liquidity and solvency. I think in the developing economy lingo, we go immediately to debt and debt overhangs and debt crisis and debt distress, as opposed to saying, no, it is a liquidity crisis, a temporary liquidity crisis, particularly now that we have access to markets, we have these bullet payments that come up. And so even if you're a country that has a 7% growth projection for the next five years, you could still have a liquidity problem in that particular month because the Ukraine war just started or inflation went up and so you were planning to pay a bullet payment of 5 billion and all of a sudden it's 8.5 and you don't have the differential. Is that a debt crisis? No. It's a solvency and liquidity problem that you can, uh, can, can be fixed. And so I think the first thing that we need to do, which is part of what we're doing here, is just the education of it and, and just letting people know what new instruments the developed world itself is using mm -hmm. and how they're using it and whether we can then begin to adopt and adapt and use some of that for the developing world. It, it's, uh, it, it sounds so uh, inspiring when you talk about it, and I, it, again, I go back to the developing world. I mean, Canada didn't have repo markets uh, since its inception. In fact, it had to develop them after the Second World War, and it was a big lift, and everybody understood. So I'm glad to see you're getting some traction uh, with this. Um, any questions? Yes. Uh, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take two at a time just so that we have um, able to get through. So we'll start with you. Thank you. A great presentation, by the way. Really enjoyed it. Uh, so I, I, I just want the, the idea is very well laid out, and it's like airtight. We, we, we know this. This is all works. The question that I have is we also know that lender of last resort function really works when you have a central bank that can issue the currency. Otherwise, people have tried different things. You can go back to banking history and so on. And Somehow, somewhere, somehow, it always breaks down until and unless you have. So, so you gave the UK example. Bank of England can do it because it was denominated in pounds and dollars in the US case and so on. And sometimes the US would be willing to open swap lines with yeah. other central banks and so on. But even if that is the case, if the buck stops with the central bank that issued the currency in question. So, so my broader question is just that long-term feasibility or practicality of it. Like, will this work? without the Fed basically signing off on this uh, at some level? I'm going to take one more question. Yes. Um, my question is, uh, should the African countries, you know, increase their gold reserve without, in order to uh, gain more liquidity? Would that be great for them as the best solution? Sorry, I didn't... I, I got, should the African countries increase their gold reserves, but I didn't get the yes, second Yes, to increase part. liquidity. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, yeah. that's, that's my question. Mm -hmm. Is that an ultimate solution for them since we have much more of our raw materials? No, thank you. Sorry, you want to get another question? No, thank you, and very good question. I think that initially this was the, the idea, right? Essentially, we have, and that's why I keep going back to the IMF in some sense, because the IMF is kind of notionally the lender of last resort for emerging market economies. And so essentially, if we had the IMF wrapping around this, that would be something that would be more, much more sustainable. And, and I believe it, it, it can. The other option, as I said, you know, you have the Bank of, Bank of New York Mellon is a systemically important financial institution in the United States precisely because it does the repo market facilities, right? It is not the Fed, but it is, you know, large enough and important enough that it does that. So then the question is, can you create something, you know, that has a similar function uh, uh, and that uh, carries that in the pri on the private sector space side. And for now, that's almost where we are, right? We're working with Bank of New York, and we're doing it uh, uh, in, that, in, in, in that space. But I, I continue to think that there is still uh, room for... I'm not a proponent necessarily that we should go out and start trying to create an African Central Bank, right? I don't think you need it. But I think what is even more important and interesting is not so much uh, the long term, is that if once we announce 
that the facility exists and people know that they can begin to use it, you already see spreads begin to collapse, right? So you already get that initial, uh, 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 just the signaling. And this is a little bit what the ECB has done when they started tightening rates. They created this new instrument for Spain, Greece, and Portugal to say, we're going to put up a stability instrument for, you know, our quote-unquote non-performing European economies. And just because of that, we didn't see their spreads go up. So some of it is a signaling issue that if you know that it exists, then you come in the market because if you know I need liquidity, I can get it from this market or another market because that security is liquid. So, and then the next thing that you're talking about, which is something we need to start working on, is creating the swap lines. Because I think the repo will work and be even more sustainable if we have more swap lines open today between the U.S. Fed and frontier market economies. We only have one in South Africa today. We need to have more. And so I think, again, it will make that market a lot more robust. And so, you know, countries like Egypt and, and, and others will have, you know, other venues of exit as opposed to going to the G20 common framework, which is not working, and we continue to talk about it. And, and, and I don't know when it's eventually going to work. On, on, on you know, what is uh, the, your reserve position? It's not so much a question of the res Your reserves, of course, are an important indicator of your debt sustainability, right? Because it means that you can actually honor some of your obligations. So yes, I know that uh, Ghana is now moving into this sort of uh, huge gold sales uh, uh, operation to shore up its reserves because they are quite low. But I think that's a different conversation right now than the conversation around around uh, uh, liquidity. It does shore up your, your what, what that will do is immediately hit your macro fundamentals, right? Because your reserve ratios are going to become a lot more comfortable. And so overall, your macroeconomic framework would look a lot sturdier and a lot stronger. We should have uh, 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 reserves, uh, uh, reserves to export ratios on the continent that are much more robust. But one of the things that happened, and that's why we're calling for more SDRs, is that African countries on average have spent about 85% of their SDRs, whereas the G7, G20 countries have only spent about 15% of their SDRs because they didn't need the additional liquidity in times of crisis because they got injections from the monetary policy side. Oh, it's going to be so hard to choose. I'm going to pick you and then a hand up here. Oh, yeah. Three. We'll take three. And Loretta, pick her. Okay. Sure. Uh, so did you want me to see? No, well, I'll, I'll do it in this order. Yeah. But thank you very much. I know we, uh, we support this. And we need to work on this together some. But I think we fully agree that really what Africa has is a problem. It's a liquidity problem, which is always the first shock. And uh, liquidity leads to solvency. And um, now, another challenge that we see is to really link to that is the issue of finance. But the key question we have, going back to the point raised by uh, Director Pacenta, is that when we look at this thing closely, can we actually address this without access to the reserve currency? And that's what I've been grappling with. Because those who are actually issuing those swap lines and so forth, then there's right the last resort. They enjoy that privilege of issuing the reserve currency, which is a major thing for them. So in other words, we have this imbalance whereby the demand for reserve currency it's one group, and the issuance, and that imbalance actually determines what happens in the market. That's the first thing. The second thing that I would like you to really uh, educate us on is what we decided to do at African Bank to say, okay, at least what we cannot control is the export side, the financing of export. But what we can ensure control is the intra-African trade. Mm -hmm. So we establish, as you know, for Pan-African payment settlement systems to reduce the need mm -hmm. for that hard currency in our trade. And I was to make sure that we could actually save up to five billion every year. Is that something that could actually help accelerate the process in the sense that we could actually transfer some of that into what you're proposing as based for sustaining its growth, because we still have the challenge of that is really the central bank backing this, and especially in the absence of that reserve currency, 
which is a major challenge. Thank you. And then, and then either one, you decide, you two decide who goes first. She does, the rig. Right. <laughs> so, um, so you mentioned the Federal Reserve um, some time. There, so there are two kinds of, uh, as you know, liquidity facilities um, that are accessible to central banks and foreign and international monetary authorities. One is like a swap lines. There's a limited set of countries, um, mostly financial centers, that have uh, access to the swap lines. And then there's the new facility that was set up in March of 2022, the FEMA repo, so mm -hmm. Foreign International Monetary Authority repo. And that functions um, also in some ways engaging with the reserve uh, question, the official reserve question, because it's a way that any country that has an account, um, an official account with the Federal Reserve, can liquefy without liquidating some of their holdings of official dollar assets, basically, like treasuries. So I guess my question for you on that, and then I have one other question, is, you know, what's the kind of view from the region on um, using those facilities? Um, so that's my first question. My second question is um, related to kind of liquidity and depth of uh, sovereign markets, and it um, uh, is about the role of China. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of debt outstanding vis-a-vis -vis China that is not very transparent, including the contract terms and and balances. So how does that kind of engage with the whole space of wanting to have deeper liquidity in these asset markets? And I'm just curious about some basic building blocks, and her first question made me more curious. What regulatory environment or context do you operate in? And what conversations do you have with the rating agencies? Do they have a view on it? Very, so I'll start with you and then I'll, I'll come around. Very, very good question. We are actually having conversations with the rating agencies and this is part of the idea is that, and, and so I said that right now we are only working with investment grade purchases of our security because eventually we would like at some point for the LSF itself to be rated and hopefully rated high enough that even just going through us will already also be uh, a cost reduction uh, uh, conversation. So we are having, we've met with all the three rating agencies and the fact that we are using Bank of New York Mellon as a custodian and all is an important component. We are still working on the funding side of, of, of the, 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 the facility and I think depending on how the funding comes in will also determine uh, uh, the rating. So we don't yet have a rating but we are uh, engaged in those conversations. I think very good questions uh, in terms of, uh, 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 first of all, China. Uh, so China, China's debt is actually cheaper than euro bonds, just so that we know what we're talking about. Uh, and, 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 and so part of the, the, the effort is to say that if we can reduce the cost of euro bonds, right, because euro bonds are slightly more transparent by definition, there's use of proceeds, the information is out there, you can Google it, you can go on the Bloomberg page, you can understand what it was taken for, then there will be an incentive Right, if the sort of China offer and the Eurobond offer were equivalent, uh, we are assuming that more people will come to the Eurobond offer because it's not that onerous and not that now post we understand that it's very, it can be quite onerous to unravel a Chinese debt. So people will go uh, 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 to, to the Eurobond market, but it has to be comparable pricing. One of the things that uh, uh, we uh, uh, sort of quote unquote we say about the Chinese debt it is fast and easy to 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 access, but the euro bond essentially is not as as onerous once you've gone to the market two three times you can do it uh, uh, enough times. So I think Ghana sort of made a a little bit of a play out of going to the euro bond markets and they did it quite quickly. Cote d'Ivoire does it and does it quite well. So I think essentially again that's the idea is to say you know. If we can create spaces where there is more transparency, then it is even better. But it has to be uh, comparable pricing, right? Because that, that's the huge differential. Sometimes it's 300 basis points differential between the euro bonds and uh, a Chinese uh, uh, debt. 
so so that's that's part of the the, the conversation that we have to have i think on the new uh, repo lines that have been created, you know, very good question. And I, unfortunately, she's left. Well, fortunately, unfortunately, but I've been talking with Lael Brennard, who is the one who is actually the brain behind these two two uh, lines. Uh, I think so. Uh, uh, about how we can have conversations with, you know, emerging markets, frontier markets, to begin to work more closely with the Fed to see whether they can have access to, you know, the swap lines, but also the facilities and what regulatory environment we need to put in place. There is a lot more work that needs to be done. Uh, around that and part of the issue and I give an example I was telling Caroline is if you remember in 2008 it, it, there was a huge push to close uh, tax havens and as part of that we introduced KYC and then we stopped all correspondent banking which meant all trade financing to the developing world stopped because we were trying to fix a justified problem just like we're doing inflation today fixing a justified problem in in some jurisdictions but killing you know other jurisdictions immediately a lot of the banks that closed during the 2008 uh, uh, KYC episode have not come back yet uh, in some sense so I think there needs to be a lot more conversations between uh, emerging market frontier market central banks and development uh, developing economy central banks even the swap lines I, and this is the next big I think uh, piece of work that needs to be done is can we open more swap lines and can we make them more stable and that uh, is also part of the conversation. Yes, eventually, I know that with the uh, 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 Russia and Ukraine war and the swift decisions and all, there is a whole huge, you know, debate about sort of the reserve currency and, you know, should we do different and should we do otherwise? The bottom line is for now, this is what we have. And, and But I think that, yes, there is going to be conversations about, you know, how we diversify. But the IMF is already doing that, right? The IMF has now a bucket of seven currencies that uh, uh, align to the SDR and you can do that. So there is already, it wasn't because of the Ukraine war or, you know, uh, uh, the, the sort of the weaponization of the dollar, if you want, that we, we think about that. But I think essentially at the end of the day, it's really about local currency borrowing and how we can bring these economies to create more robust capital markets in their own currencies. But even that sometimes, you know, so, so when somebody who has called us is the, the uh, well, I wouldn't say, but one of the large uh, fund managers or fi uh, uh, finance ministers in an emerging market economy in Asia, uh, the pension funds in that country were extremely exposed to the dollar, but also to the local government issued T-bills. With tightening in the United States, they cannot meet their monthly obligations, so they need immediate liquidity, otherwise the pension funds will collapse. And so they're looking for short-term liquidity to honor those obligations. And so they said, can you help us? And we said, well, you know, eventually this instrument can help you, but for now we can't touch you because we don't know anything about your governance structures and systems. So I think part of it is about the governance of how we can sort of work around local currency deepening of capital markets to make them robust. I think that the, 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 the CFTA is a powerful instrument for intra-Africa trade. But at some point, we're still going to have to trade with the outside of the CFTA, right? Because it's all global supply chains that are coming in and out. And so while I think that the payment systems is particularly important uh, for us, part of that infrastructure now, and I was telling Caroline this, is that, you know, the developed world is rushing off to central bank digital currency and stable coins. Can we begin to work on that as well so that we can make sure that we optimize some of these processes in a way that is transparent but also flattening uh, the, the, the curve without necessarily saying, you know, it is the reserve currency that's the dollar that's the problem because we already have, I think, through the IMF, that basket that is beginning to move and change and, and shift. So, yes, uh, uh, look at uh, improving uh, uh, payment systems on the continent. More importantly, can we do more local currency financing? And then it doesn't, it's sort of, it's, we, we come agnostic to whether it's the Angolan, uh, 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 I don't know what the Angolans use, the Angolan uh, <laughs> the question, pound, Kwasha, the, question, question, the Angola Kwasha, or, yes. or, 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 you know, the Kenya shilling, it, 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 will, it will become sort of immaterial. But I think it's the infrastructure that we need, uh, that we need to improve upon and see. And I always use the example of Asia, right? Asia doesn't have a central currency. Asia, you know, it's, it's between Malaysia, Japan, and uh, uh, and South Korea, they, each of them have their own currencies, but what they're doing now is they have a central bank digital currency that they're using to trade and they're clearing in three. Uh, actually, I found out that the Boston Fed is working on a system that will clear 1.8 million transactions a second in the developed world. Now, if we have that kind of fast clearing systems here, and then we have systems that are taking three weeks in Africa to clear and that, 
then you can just imagine the asymmetries in marketing and that you need to put together. And I think that's part of what we have to do. Is again, it's all about the. In I think we all know what we need to do to get macroeconomic fundamentals right. We know, you know, it's your debt, it's your clean revenue, but there's a huge it's this road thing. It's the potholes, you know. We need to fix that. We need better infrastructure in the financial markets to now make our development work and work faster and better. Well, I think that, oh, okay, we have time. I got one more hand. I, I'm looking, oh, the thing is, we were cutting into dinner and I was giving strict instructions. So one more question, and I'm going to leave it to you two gentlemen to decide which one of you. <laughs> Did you go ahead. I already asked one earlier. Did you go ahead? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's true. That's right. You did. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And then, and then we'll just take five minutes, and then we're using ourselves of your, of your time. I came here to ask. Quick question on the question on the eligibility criteria, because I know the objective is not to serve a legitimizing credit function, um, and you have a basket of uh, your first package. In Angola, Egypt, and Kenya, I believe, mm -hmm. variations around the single mm -hmm. B rating. Um, the principle of repo is that we're at par. You put par in, and you get par back. Can you talk a little bit on how you, you're building out your, your criteria and how eventually that will be broadened out to have real impact in Africa and elsewhere? So essentially, just so that we are we are we are a quote unquote a new kid on the blocks, and so we've so, and and we've been working on this for two years. So we've gotten all the different questions, and so what we decided to do, and that's why we decided first, we will only work with uh, countries that have a stable uh, a, a rating or, or appreciation from the IMF. Article four, there is an article four. You don't have to have an IMF program, but you have to have an article four that says. The macroeconomic fundamentals are good and then that. So this is sort of on the countryside. But we don't really deal, and that's the important thing. Our exposure and our risk is not country risk. Our exposure and our risk is with the purchaser of that security. And so for that, we've decided that we're only going to deal with, you know, the sort of investment grade purchases of our security. So we're not dealing with vulture funds or you know, if Chris comes off the street and wants to buy a uh, uh, Cameroon uh, paper, no, we're not doing that with him, right? Because we want to eventually be able to be rated ourselves, and we will be rated based on the risk that we hold. So if we hold AAA investment grade risk, then that's how the kind of uh, rating... Uh... Now, on the funding side, what we're hoping to get initially was we're hoping to get funded through the SDRs, but that's not going to work. So now we're hoping that we can get funded through central banks. And the argument, particularly for emerging market economy central banks, is to say, if you're investing your resources and your reserves in, say, UST Brazil before uh, uh, rates went up, you know, we can offer you better. And through the same mechanism, your country gets better access to markets. So it's a win-win uh, in some sense. And so we are looking at talking with some central banks. But for example, we have G7 uh, economy central banks that have said, you know, this is interesting and we'll look at it because right now our rates are so low that we can uh, uh, offer you some liquidity to start uh, as counterparty funding for, for, for the process. And actually, some, uh, we found out some G7 economies actually are indirect purchases of our bonds. And so essentially, you can come in and buy stuff. Uh, that. So that's, that's a little bit what we're doing now is to really, and that's why we are not going, eventually we would like to work with Latin America and uh, uh, Asia, and, but for now we're starting with Africa, and a very second, it's, it, we, we need to prove the concept, right? We've done the first deal, and now working with Amundi on the second one, and we have two or three others coming, all of them investment grade, you know, good uh, 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 security holders, and so bond and asset managers you know, of the highest quality. And I think once we have that showed up, then we will be able to open up much better. So, um... <laughs> <laughs> It's, okay, not, so it's, not, it's not a question. I just want to, why do I have everyone's attention? Yes, have everyone's there attention. There is a reception for all of you uh, in the lobby. So just go down and in the lobby um, just below us. So I'm so that's glad all you I did wanted. That. I just wanted to I, say that. So I didn't want you. to. Because I was about to cave. I, and I thought, I'm an ex central banker, and I promised one more question. If there's two, I've completely lost. You, you, you actually you would have lost credibility. Right? <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. It's time to thank, thank our speaker.